These monsters are known by such evocative names as Crushing Rocks, Monster Who Kicks People Off Cliffs, Shifting Sands, Great Winged One, Tracking Bear, and Big Monster. They were created either by the Sunbearer's promiscuous dalliances or by masturbatory acts by the first women during the separation of the sexes in the previous world reality. The monsters are aberrations of body and mind. They are terrifying powers of the natural world with which the Navajo's ancestors had to become reconciled so that the ideal world and the real world might coincide. In order to reach their father's home, the twins had to vanquish or evade several such monsters. According to the Navajo warrior's rights narrative, the twins eventually arrived at their father's house of dawn, situated on an island in the far eastern ocean where the white light mist of the east glows at the horizon. His glorious Hogan was guarded by fierce protector animals of the four directions. The twins succeeded in pacifying them with the help of certain supernatural tutelaries such as Spider Grandmother. Once inside Sunbearer's home, they met his wife, and according to some accounts, his daughter. Both were beautiful and kind, unlike their father, who was at first quite wrathful. True to his nature, he subjected the adolescent boys to harrowing tests of their authenticity. They survived by the strength of their motivation and with the help of Sunbearer's wife slash daughter, as well as through the aid of other supernatural beings and objects. The tests completed, Sunbearer recognized the boys as his true sons, and they were transformed by him and the Thunderers into full-fledged spiritual warriors. Now empowered, the twins were renamed Monster Slayer and Childborn for Water. They returned to the Navajo's sacred land and to their mother, White Shell Changing Woman, along a rainbow pathway. They then went about ridding the fifth world reality of its most terrifying monsters. As expressions of Changing Woman's spectrum of powers, her dark and light energies, the unit that is the warrior twins comprises the qualities of the compassionate warrior. Their combined qualities of fearless protection and generous cooperation are the essence of the ideal Navajo personality. This balance of warrior qualities is reinforced in the exploits of heroes and heroines of the Navajo's grand healing rites. The sacred histories reenacted in the rites first describe the heroines dispelling obstacles in order to attain spiritual medicine and knowledge. Their protective work completed, they ensure that the sacred teachings are returned and established Established among the people. The compassionate warrior also figures prominently in the Tibetan psyche. In the Tibetan heroic public vision, King Gezar of Ling takes center stage. His cycle of stories comprises the national epics of Tibet and Mongolia. His origins are so cloaked in the mist of time that the nomadic bards who still recite his exploits by heart present them through the combined cultural and perceptual filters of the Paleolithic shaman, the Bon and the Buddhist. The Gezar epic presents mythically the battle between the powers of illumination and the forces of darkness. It is the story of a spiritual warrior's quest for order, not of some totalitarian kind, but one that is in synchrony with the cosmos, Tashi. Gezar bards sing in a time on earth when all was in disorder, so a sky divinity sent one of his sons to earth by means of a rainbow mucord. He became the leader of the people. Since the father divinity was associated with the sacred mountain summit and the mother was a queen of the serpentine Lu powers, this made Gesar, according to this pre-Buddhist version, the son of earth waters and sky's ethereal light, much like the Navajo unit that is monster slayer, conceived of a sunbeam and child born for water, conceived by a streamlet from a waterfall. Gesar encountered numerous hazards in the world at large and from within his own family, but, like the Navajo twins, he received assistance on his quest. In his case it was from a powerful flying horse. With the animal's help he won a fiercely contested horse race and became ruler of the Kingdom of Ling in the Kham region of eastern Tibet. On becoming King of Ling, Gesar was clothed in a magical helmet and armor. Mounted on his turquoise-colored wind horse, he led his fellow spiritual warriors on campaigns to dispel demons and giant monsters haunting the people and their world. With their work completed, Gesar and his spiritual warriors were said to have taken divine rebirth in Shambhala. 
There they presently await the command of the king of Shambhala to venture forth through a door in a rock on the eastern shore of the soul lake of Shambhala. Gesar, who according to the Buddhist view is now an emanation of the Bodhisattva boundless love, will lead his army against barbarian hordes who will have destroyed Buddhism outside the pure land of Shambhala. According to this prophecy, they will vanquish the enemies of righteousness and other demonic powers to usher in an eon of peace and light in the world. Trungpa Rinpoche illuminates the importance of the concept of warriorship on the spiritual path of life in his guidebook, Shambhala, the Sacred Path of the Warrior. The book, in fact, is dedicated to Gesar of Ling. In it, Trungpa unveils the deep essence of spiritual warriorship. He writes that warriorship refers to realizing the power, dignity, and wakefulness that is inherent in all of us as human beings. It is awakening our basic human confidence which allows us to cheer up, develop a sense of vision, and succeed in what we are doing. By heroically realizing the wisdom and illumined possibilities inherent in our own ordinary world, one discovers the magic of reality. The primordial wisdom of the world is as it is, concludes Trungpa Rinpoche. Trungpa Rinpoche calls this natural wisdom and pure awareness drala, meaning above or beyond the enemy. The law practice related to the words for the consciousness principle and mountain pass signifies existence above something, while dra refers to an enemy or obstacle. Trungpa Rinpoche likens the Drala principle to wisdom beyond aggression, saying the Drala principle is realizing that your own wisdom as a human being is not separate from the powers of things as they are. So by understanding one's connection with the font of reality and power and using the motivation of selfless compassion, one becomes empowered to confront the demons and obstacles in life. One gains Drala, one stands above the enemy. Tibetans and Navajos recognize that the cosmos is replete with entities with which one must become reconciled. This is accomplished through realizing a balance of power within one's own body-mind and immediate environment. In Trungpa's Drala teachings, the spiritual warrior creates a sacred, geomantic space out of the immediate environment, outer Drala, then realizes the unity of his or her inner bodily reality with the natural architecture of things, inner drala. Eventually, and most important, one arrives at what Trungpa calls the tremendous wakefulness, tremendous nowness in your state of mind. He calls this secret drala. The pursuit of secret drala is undoubtedly connected with the unique Tibetan custom of stinging up lines of of stringing up lines of prayer flags, known colloquially by the name of the wind horse printed at their center. Secret Drala is, according to Trungpa Rinpoche, the experience of raising wind horse, raising a wind of delight and power, and riding on or conquering that energy. In raising the cloth virgins of the wind horse, one ritually begins to cut through the enemy obstacles of life and body-mind with the principle of Drala. In calling upon the peaceful protector gods by means of the offering rite of which the flags are a part, one wields the elemental powers of earth, water, fire, air and space as indicated in the flag's five colors one is borne along by the energy of the wind horse like a mounted warrior of shambhala heroically recreating one's ordinary reality in the manner of a sacred world to accomplish this mission the spiritual warrior must possess a compassionate heart must have seen reality with the clear light of awakened mind illuminated as if by the clear first rays of dawn's light and act appropriately to dispel the veils the enemies are obstacles that block one from experiencing reality as a sacred world see appendix four harnessing protective powers the invincible teacher the enemy has now come to be known, engaged, and hopefully vanquished through the wisdom and motivation of compassionate warriorship. But one step remains on the path of spiritual heroism. In some ways, it is the most difficult act of spiritual heroism. It requires that sacred knowledge and procedures be transmitted to others. This necessitates an impeccable, indeed invincible, approach to teaching and leadership. This second aspect of the spiritual hero can be called the invincible teacher. 
Tibetan and Navajo spiritual histories tell of human beings who managed to pass into the realm of the divinities. There, after great difficulty, they gained spiritual empowerment and with it sacred knowledge and techniques. Their major achievement was to bring this wisdom back to their world for the good of all. Navajos and Tibetans identify with several important role models of the invincible teacher. The Dreamer's Journey to the Land of the Gods Navajo sacred histories tell of heroines who enrich the lives of the earth surface people with sacred teachings and practices acquired during a sojourn among the holy people. These are then taught to a younger sibling who becomes the first chanter of the new spiritual lineage. Once this has been completed, the heroine returns to the sky or into the earthborn, or on a rainbow or a sunbeam. Then he or she becomes a holy person, imbued with everlasting life according to beauty. The hero of the Nightway's spiritual narrative, the dreamer, B. Altatini, his visions, personifies the invincible spiritual teacher. He embarked on a dangerous quest into the ideal reality of the Ye'i, tutelaries in search for of sacred wisdom the dreamer was a young man who often had elaborate visions of blue-faced beings when he told his brothers about them no one took him seriously in fact when they were about to depart for a hunt the brothers would laugh saying that he should stay home instead and have his visions nevertheless the youth wanted to be a hunter and he followed them one night, while the others were out hunting, he dreamed that his brothers had wantonly killed too many deer, along with two sacred birds, and that this act put his brothers out of beauty with the holy people. In fact, the dream's prophecy proved true. After that, no game came his brother's way. One day, while returning home from the hunt, the dreamer spied four bighorn sheep. He crept up to them. Four times he tried to draw an arrow in his bow, and four times his arm went into spasms and grew numb. He was unable to shoot at them. It was then that he noticed their blue faces, faces the color of the sky, the color of the faces of the people in his visions, the holy people. The two male and two female uh, Gaaskidi, bighorn sheep yei, calmly walked over to the suffering youth, bade him to disrobe, and put on a sheepskin and horns. In this way he became one of them. He joined them as they trotted to the edge of the sheer walls of Atseyi, Canyon de Celli, and together they stepped off the edge. When his brothers came to look for him, all they could find were four sets of sheep prints, meeting one set of moccasin prints, then five sets of sheep prints ending at the canyon rim sandstone cliffs. The bighorn sheep holy people took the dreamer to Kininakai, which is now called White House Ruin. It sits in a vast rock cave just above the floor of the canyon. This is the home of one family of the Ye'i tutelaries. And here, the first nightway ceremony for the daughter of calling God of White House was about to begin. During the ceremony, the dreamer became paralyzed on hearing talking God's distinct call, Woo, who, 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 and was brought back into beauty by the bighorn sheep people. He was then directed to learn the songs and prayers and to watch the dancing yeis all night long as necessary steps in learning the night way right. It is said that the dreamer witnessed the entire nine nights and days of the ceremony. He learned the songs, prayers, dances, and physical treatments of the one sung over. He also learned how to make the elaborate sand paintings used during the latter days of the rite for curing confusion, headaches, blindness, deafness, and paralysis. Having himself been cured and possessed sacred wisdom, the dreamer returned to his family. He stayed long enough to teach the Nightway rite to his youngest brother. The brother became the first chanter of the Nightway among the people. At the first ceremony performed by his brother, people came from far and wide to be restored to beauty. This ceremony was also witnessed by many of the holy people, who then departed, taking the dreamer with them. Before leaving, the dreamer told his chanter brother that he was going to everlasting life among the other holy people, and that he would always watch over his people. They would know of his watchful presence, he went on, by his voice, which would be the voice of the thunder and the falling rain. He said, this said uh, he disappeared with the other holy people. 
the teacher of the world. Like the Navajos, Tibetans hold the highest regard spiritual for spiritual heroes who are great teachers. Their primary model is the archetypal hero of Buddhism, a tibeto burman prince who lived over 2,500 years ago, first named Gautama of the Shakya clan. He would later come to be known as Shakyamuni Buddha and as teacher of the world. <coughs> His personal quest to attain insight into the nature of reality involved great suffering and heroism. Thus the story begins with Gautama's father, a regional king, who had heard a prophecy that his son would become either a great king or a spiritual teacher. Wishing him to be the former, the king kept Gautama insulated from the harsh realities of the world so as to ennoble him and preclude any wish on the son's part to become a teacher. But Gautama wanted very much to see the world at large. Finally, the king relented, and during his first journey outside the palace's walls, the young Gautama saw four signs representing the obstacles of ordinary existence. He encountered a very old man, old age. He saw a very ill person, sickness, a corpse, death, and an itinerant yogi, one who had renounced the illusory material aspects of the world. These signs from Samsara so impressed Gautama that he renounced his wealth and station in order to seek a way to release others from his world reality sufferings. Gautama had many adventures and met with many obstacles on his heroic spiritual journey, but the pivotal episode in his quest for enlightenment came during the moments before his attainment of full illumination in a forest in northern India. As the future Buddha meditated deeply on the nature of reality, the deep demon of illusion Mara materialized before him. Realizing that his potentially greatest enemy was peacefully sitting there in meditation, Mara contrived to block Gautama's enlightenment. Mara called upon his three daughters, anger, desire, and ignorance, to dance enticingly before Gautama, but the young meditator could not be distracted. Mara then transformed himself into a messenger, claiming that the prince's parents desperately needed Gautama's aid. But through his acquired insight and wisdom, Gautama knew differently. In desperation, Mara called in his army, directing them to throw all their weapons and forces of illusion at the young man. But when the tips of their lances, arrows, and fires entered the new Buddha's aura, they turned to flowers. Finally, a highly agitated Mara demanded of Gautama as to why he, a mere human, should think himself blessed with enlightenment, saying, I, Mara, am the one who should rightly be teacher of the world. Mara's army of demons of illusion seconded his claim. Then Mara asked Gautama Shakyamuni, who is witness to your claim to Buddhahood? And Buddha replied, extending his right hand down toward the earth, The earth is my witness. With this action the goddess of the earth rose up, and hands clasped in a gesture of respect affirmed the Buddha's response. Mara was completely defeated. His and thus Gautama's delusory view of reality and resulting ignorance had been vanquished by the young spiritual hero's determination and clarity of mind. From that point onward, Gautama became the great teacher of this world era. Having realized the light of pure awareness and ability to see the true nature of things, the Buddha extended his heart outward to all beings over the next half century, <coughs> bringing his wisdom back to the world for the benefit of others. Not surprisingly, in succeeding centuries, the Buddha would become the fundamental image of the heroic spiritual teacher for a majority of humanity. Milarepa the heroic journey into the ideal state of being is vividly told in the life story of Milarepa, Tibet's most celebrated yogin saint. Milarepa's life began with familial deceit and tragedy. An evil uncle dis exploited Milarepa's widowed mother and children. In ignorant desperation, the young man turned to revenge by black magic, but inadvertently wrought havoc upon his family and fellow villagers. Realizing with horror the significance of his actions, Milarepa sought out the great yogin Marpa for Buddhist teachings. 
In his wisdom, Marpa forced the young man to exhaust his negative karma by having him undergo severe and frustrating trials. Only then did Marpa accept Milarepa as a disciple. Milarepa eventually achieved illumination after years of contemplation and practice in isolated mountaintop caves throughout the north slope of the Himalayas. When Milarepa returned to his destroyed village in order to confront the results of his actions, he discovered that his mother had died in the interim. This event motivated him like none other to spread the Buddhist teachings as an antidote to human suffering. Milarepa became the greatest popular spiritual teacher of the 11th and 12th centuries CE, providing teachings uh, through the medium of poetry and song. Today, most Tibetans know by heart many of the 100,000 songs that he composed during his years of asceticism. Milarepa's name, meaning cotton-clad Mila, refers to his having worn only the lightest of cotton clothing, actually nothing more than a toga, in the extreme climate above 14,000 feet. Although Mila's path was an austere one, it was enriched with inner growth and by seeing the beneficial effects upon the Tibetans who came to him for teachings and blessings. When Milarepa died at the hands of a jealous monk by taking poisoned food that was offered to him, fully conscious of the danger, he was still teaching. He understood the lesson it would provide to the deluded young man. Milarepa's story reflects the Mahayana Buddhist ideal of the heroic teacher who, having experienced great hardship on his or her journey to illumination, voluntarily forestalls final absorption into the void in order to aid other sentient beings on their way to enlightenment. His was the path of the bodhisattvas, beings who have gone beyond the afflictions of ordinary consciousness through sustained psychic connection to the void's ideal state of emptiness, but hold back their ultimate return to the rainbow and sunbeam-adorned Buddha fields until their vows to help others to enlightenment have been fulfilled. As such, aspiring bodhisattvas of the human realm are sometimes described, as in the Mahayana Buddhist teachings, as bodhisattva heroes or bodhisattva warriors. Personal sacrifice for the purpose of initiating and guiding others into life's sacred path is the core quality of the Tibetan and Navajo invincible teacher. The invincible teacher is the integrative uh, is is the integrative aspect of the universal principle of spiritual heroism and the natural complement to the warrior with a heart. The warrior prepares the ground in which the seeds of the teacher's wisdom bloom. Ultimate Union Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is none other than form. Form is none other than emptiness. From the Heart Sutra. <clears throat> Symbols conveying the union of opposites are by far the most commonplace visual expressions in the spiritual arts of Tibetans and Navajos. Those spiritually occurring polar energies that constantly attract and repel one another in the dance of life are often depicted in symbols of sexuality, such as the Sky Man Earth Woman unit or the primordial Buddha pair. This need to balance polar forces is verbalized every day, sometimes every hour, and possibly even every minute, by the serious spiritual practitioner in both cultures. Tibetans use two terms to depict a person in his or her spiritual dance with the cosmos. The older mantra is Tashi Dele, meaning long life, health, and good fortune the path of life. In an auspicious relationship with the cosmos, the goal of life, the newer but similarly intended sacred utterance is Om Mani Padme Hum, meaning blissful compassion, the path of life, in search of wisdom, knowing the empty nature of the cosmos, the goal of life. The traditional Navajo intones in such song and prayer the mantra Sa'a Nagai Bike Hozho, which translates as successfully attaining a ripe old age by daily spiritual renewal, the path of life, according to the universal beauty of the cosmos, the goal of life. Accordingly, both traditions understand that all people, or sentient beings, exist poised between and encompassing two simultaneous realities, the real and ideal worlds, which must be reconciled through the heroic spiritual journey in order for life to be meaningful.
The conventional real world of external forms is perceived through the reduced vision of our sense organs. For Tibetans, it is a reality laced with psychophysical suffering, along with its root cause, self-bewildering ignorance. Despite this unfortunate state of affairs, Tibetans see it as a state of great power and possibilities, although the mind's radiant and all-knowing nature is blocked to this realization by its own internal veils and subtle physical imbalances. The body-mind is temporarily captured in a web it itself has woven. This results in the mental and physical sufferings characterizing samsara. Tibetans know that by following the lead of spiritual heroines who have already gone over to the ideal realm by means of the tantric path, cessation of this suffering and at one with the emptiness of the void are attainable by all. To the Navajo, the reality of sky and earth is full of power and natural order. But earth surface walkers, human beings, are not fully in balance and properly empowered with its spiritual beauty. This, despite our possessing an inner awareness and vital force that is of the same stuff as the cosmos. The Navajos know that it is the instanding one, the mind and wind divinity within, that is the real person. By purifying this being of its faults, according to the beliefs and practices of the Chantway path, one moves toward everlasting life according to beauty. This insight of universal wisdom, recognizing the simultaneity of ordinary and ideal reality, is vividly expressed in the Blessing Way teachings. Here, first man and first woman, the first teachers and leaders of the ancient people, are, exoterically at least, considered to have had a negative witchcraft side to their thoughts and actions, even their material objects. Some Navajo consider them to have gone astray during the period of emergence, which explains the need for guidance from a new regime of divinities led by changing woman and talking god. But many of the great chanters and philosophers pointedly differ with this superficial belief. They basically agree that the first leaders planned the inclusion of negativity into their actions and objects for a very good reason. This is that, given the nature of things, the existence of beauty is inextricably linked with the aspiration to achieve it. So, to achieve everlasting life requires the existence of death, and to gain the beauty of Hozho requires the existence of obstacles and enemies, Na'aye'e, and similar manifestations of anti-beauty, Hokho, um, ex including witchcraft. The Navajo frequently talk about skinwalkers, nocturnal witches, and warlocks who by anti-beauteous thoughts, words, and deeds sap the vital force of family members and others. By speaking of these negative members of their society, the Navajo vividly reify their motivation to attain a state of beauty, although most are unaware of this purpose. Likewise do the Tibetans with their hair-raising tales of rolang, zombies, and tray, ghosts, reinforce their motivation to escape the suffering of samsaric rebirth. To reinforce this creative tension between beauty and anti-beauty, the Navajo have developed a world view that the Western philosopher uh, John Farella describes as a paradox. The Navajo knows that competition, self-oriented action, although a given of ordinary human reality, can lead to harm should its surplus not be shared with others. <clears throat> this is the witchcraft way. If it becomes a source of general benefit, it is part of the beauty way. The paradox is how to achieve, to be successful in life, but to do it cooperatively and compassionately. Farella calls it to be selfish but social. The idea is to strive for success and gain, but then redistribute the wealth or wisdom for the benefit of all. Thus the Navajo paradox is concerned with how to use the energy and conditions of the ordinary state of the real world, Sa'anagai, on the path toward the absolute or ideal state of being, Bikehozo, 
Similarly, tantric Buddhist teachers remind us that there is no difference between the suffering state of samsara and the blissful state of nirvana. They are two sides of the same reality coin. The difficulty comes when some absolutes as samsara and nirvana, or evil and good, I and thou, are considered as separate, self-existing entities rather than as facets of the same inviolable system. The dynamic unity of the ideal in the real is a state best experienced through the imagination, yet it is a realm toward which one strives by means of daily spiritual heroics. Although the ideal goal may be initially beyond one's present grasp, the means for attaining it are very much part of the real world. Lama Govinda described the ultimate union of inner and outer, real and ideal, when he metaphorically observed, We may break a piece of magnetized steel as often as we like. We shall never be able to separate the positive from the negative pole. Each fragment will always have both. This shows that polarity is an aspect of unity, not an arbitrary duality, but an inseparable whole. Matter is the context and process for attaining its goal of spirit, mind. The real world is the only way to the ideal, since the ideal is inextricably linked to the real. The Bodhisattva Boundless Love phrased it best in a teaching to his disciple Shariputra that has come to be known as the Heart Sutra. One section reads, Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is none other than form. Form is none other than emptiness. In the same way, feelings, mental events, karma-forming actions, and consciousness itself are, at their basis, all empty. Therefore, Shariputra, all phenomena are empty, without self-existing characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. The tension between matter and mind, the real and ideal worlds within us all, is the dance between experiencing life on the imperfect, microcosmic plane and the macrocosmic sense of the ideal. But to do the dance requires a much awakened awareness and a spiritual warrior's courage. There is no other way. The alternative is perennially to sleepwalk into the walls of one's self-created prison. The journey into union between the finite body-mind and the infinite font of which it is a part is best expressed through the channels of sacred music, poetry, and the visual arts. This is a series of compelling Navajo sacred songs in which the singers visualize themselves as talking God and calling God as they embark on a heroic spiritual journey. It consists of halting one's aimless wandering in a state of anti-beauty and the eventual return to the ideal state of beauty within oneself. The refrains of the songs give the sense of the process of the healing journey to be taken by the chanter and the one sung over. The first song's refrain is, I, now I wander about. This is followed by other refrains, I, now I have turned around. I, now I stopped moving. I, now I am returning. I, now I have come back. I, now I sit down. This musical rendering of the reintegrative journey takes many minutes to complete. It has many phrases to get exactly right and in proper order. Not to do so would sap the power of the song or prayer and possibly cause irreversible psychophysical harm. Therefore, chanters have devised memory-aiding diagrams for spiritual bookkeeping. The great chanter, son of bead chant singer, drew one such diagram in the early 1950s. Embedded in the diagram's symbolic shorthand of simple pictographs is a significant symbol of the ultimate union. The great symbol. The first of each pair of symbols signifies the song phrase Sa'anagai, representing the relative human experience of the sacred world. Sa'anagai is presented either as a simple cross or a cross with one axis having two legs attached. Its completion into the BK Hozho state of absolute beauty is signified by adding certain extra lines. This gives the cross a sense of dynamism. The ordinary reality of the chanter and one sung over in the ceremony are thus sent into proper motion and order according to the principles of beauty. The resulting symbol from Son of Bead Chant Singer's Song Diagram 
forms none other than one of humankind's most important and, sadly, most maligned ancient symbols, the swastika. Historically, the swastika is universally recognized as a preeminent symbol of life and balance and of the eternal process of creating harmony throughout time and space. The philosophers of ancient India bestowed upon us its name, meaning auspicious, swas, mark, tika. Lama Govinda, whose wisdom transcended that of Tibetan spirituality, called the swastika the symbol of eternal creativeness. Its creativity is eternal because it is the movement of the cosmos, in synchrony with which the spiritual heroine strives to become the divine version of him or herself. We have already encountered the universal cross as the university as the uni, as the unity of its two axes. The changing dawn dusk east west axis is the vector of the conventional real world experience, the path and male principle. The static noon night south north axis is the vector of absolute ideal world experience, the goal and female principle. When set in motion, activated as a swastika, the moving cross symbolizes the ultimate union of the two worlds, the individual body-mind and the cosmos combined. For Tibetans and Navajos, all mentally visualized and physically experienced aspects of reality reflect the complementary energies composing the seamless union of self and cosmos. Their cosmos is an eternal dance of dual tendencies, and the dance is done by two partners who might be called she who knows, the ideal state of being, and he who strives to understand, the path to the ideal state. Seeing their reality, in this dialectical way reveals that both cultures operate on a dialectical mathematical model. In the mid-1980s, a little-known but highly significant research paper was published by an information scientist in current anthropology. The paper compared the, strict, the structure of the tantric mandala with the symbolic system operating in Navajo sand paintings. By comparing the way they encode information, it was discovered that Navajos and tantric Buddhists were using the same, and interestingly the most efficient, system for encoding spiritual data. They had each recreated or preserved the universal spiritual computer language, in which the mind preserves as their computer's central processing unit, while the arts and ritual are software to make the data intelligible. Shall we use our psychosomatic computers as they do for spiritual illumination, or shall we continue to amass data having no relationship to wisdom? The way the Tibetans and Navajos apply the binary code of the spirit to their daily thoughts and lives is the focus of the third universal principle, cent uh, centering in the mandala of self and cosmos. Not until mankind shall transcend dualism and phenomenal appearances and realize the natural at one of all living creatures will they be able to formulate a sound standard of morality based entirely upon worldwide bodhisattvic altruism. W.Y. Evans Wentz Part 3. Centering in the Mandala of Self and Cosmos In beauty before me I walk, in beauty behind me I walk, in beauty below me I walk, in beauty above me I walk, in beauty all around me I walk. It is finished in beauty, it is finished in beauty, it is finished in beauty, it is finished in beauty. Navajo Benediction The Tantric Initiate comes to be identified with the center of the mandala, the point from which all goes forth and to which all returns, and from where the archetypal essences stream forth in luminous rays which pervade the whole world, arousing it from nothing and reabsorbing it. Giuseppe Tucci I saw myself on the central mountain of the world, the highest place, and I had a vision because I was seeing in the sacred manner of the world. The central mountain is everywhere. Black Elk, Lakota Sioux. At the center of the sacred world. There is at the surface infinite variety of things. At the center there is simplicity and unity of cause. Ralph Waldo Emerson. The real and ideal states of living thinking and expressing are ultimately inseparate. 
But in order for this understanding to work in their lives, people need to become fully present, awake and aware in their place between earth and sky. They must find that still point at the center of the world's seething field of energies and tendencies that push and pull all their every step on the spiritual path of living. Tibetans and Navajos have made knowledge of this process the centerpiece of their lives, and as a map of their path straddling the two realities, they have developed and preserved for successive generations what can be called the Mandala view of self and cosmos. For Westerners, centering in the here and now seems at first to be an impossible task, given our extremely complex and fragmented world. So we must turn to the native peoples and religious mystics for our inspiration. They see the world as a dynamic but integrated whole, a holy world full of perfect potential, with a spectrum of powers that can either aid them or block them from realizing the ideal state of being in their lives. Native peoples and mystics universally reckon their place at the center of a sacred circle. The circle is the most elegant rendering of all-encompassing closure, stability, and unity. It is humankind's most widespread symbol, found in the spiritual art of every culture and epoch, as well as in all natural systems. Western spiritual scientists, from Plato to the psychologist Carl Jung, have devoted their creative genius to exploring the meaning of the circle in dreams, art, religion, and nature. Their conclusion, put simply, is that the circle is the fundamental expression and archetype of the seamless unity between the individual psyche and the mind of the cosmos at large. Navajo and Tibetan philosophers symbolize the unity of self and cosmos as a cross within a circle and a smaller circle within the cross. The larger circle defines the all-encompassing character of the ideal reality, be it beauty or the void, and the smaller one's ordinary reality. The fourfold sections of the cross define naturally occurring characteristics of ordinary time and space, such as phases of the day, seasons, life stages, and so on. The quadrants also present the way an individual's thoughts, energies, and actions naturally manifest and move toward a state of equilibrium. This mandala view of reality is symbolized schematically by Navajos and Tibetans. Each quarter of this circle of the spirit signifies an essential quality, energy, and aspect of knowledge whose sum total is the greater cycle and simultaneously the lesser one. These four natural vectors link the outer and inner circles of macrocosm and microcosm, ideal and real worlds, sky and earth, nature and the individual body-mind. The parallels between the way Tibetans and Navajos envisioned this unity through the metaphor of the mandala led Joseph Campbell to describe them as two very different cultures with the same imagery and energies. Trungpa Renpache described mandala as a general pattern linking you to the rest of the world. Such a network of energies, ideas, and tendencies with one's body-mind at its hub can be either an ego-directed, samsaric mandala, or a divinely inspired, enlightenment mandala. The former describes our tainted body-mind reality, while the latter is the model toward which we must aspire. Tibetans and Navajos strive to pattern themselves and their lives according to the ideal mandala model. The mandala is almost always a visual expression of the perfect pattern in all things and a prime metaphor of the quest of the spiritual hero toward the central still point in a changing world. In the process of moving to the center, the seeker becomes transformed. The sense of self merges into the pattern of energies and tendencies differentiating out of what Western mystics call the primordial ground, the unblemished, illuminated, and pristine state of being. At the primordial ground, one's ordinary self is dissolved and exchanged for an ideal state of awareness and vitality that once discovered is brought back from the mandala's core by the spiritual heroine to the enrichment of others. The mandala view of self and cosmos is a constant reminder to preserve this center mind in the maelstrom of ordinary life, and it teaches respect for all other thinking and feeling beings with whom we share the light of mind and breath of life, 
who strive to be at the center of their own mandalas. Tibetans use the word combination keel core for mandala. Core refers to a wheel, circumference, or surroundings, i.e. circle, while keel, pronounced kin, signifies a center. Together, as kin core, each mandala symbolizes one of numerous versions of an ideal reality populated by ideal beings, tantric tutelary divinities, and ultimately issuing out of the formless, primordial ground of the void. In naming their mandalas, the Navajo refer less to the physical structure of these psychrocosmograms and refer to their psychrocosmic purpose. <coughs> Their generally circular sand paintings are called i'ika, meaning they, uh, where they, the Chantwe tutelary divinities, come and go. Like the Tibetan versions of the universal pattern, four-part Navajo mandalas contain images of divinities who are emblems of body-mind energies and qualities that derive from a state of beauty. The fourfold mandala pattern is, we know, the model for Navajo and Tibetan maps of their sacred worlds. But like the reality depicted within their ritual mandalas, they also conceive of their ordinary realities as ideal realms. They hold this view because their reality had never been thought of as ordinary or profane in the first place. Tibetans and Navajos never have had a fall from a Garden of Eden. The 19th century scholar of Tibetan religion, L. Augustine Waddell, described the Tibetan as living in a world of the marvelous, an observation that holds equally true for the Navajo. The marvelous is none other than the ideal that permeates the real world, and it is most completely expressed in the image of the mandala. Keeping this perspective in mind, we can now consider the code and variations of the marvelous mandalas of the Navajo and Tibetan people. Navajo Mandala when the Navajo Studies Program at the Rough Rock Community Schools sought a visual symbol of the structure and purpose of Navajo education, a respected chanter was commissioned to execute it. The result, in the form of a poster, faithfully depicted the inner structure of mandalas that are often painted in sand. The poster was entitled Philosophy of Navajo Teaching, From the Center of Life to the Four Directions, and the Lower and Upper Life, and coded within it are the basic elements of the Chantway Path to Beauty. The result is a fundamental mandala depicting the interconnection among things, thoughts, and energies. To understand this model mandala, we must recall that according to the Blessing Way teachings, beauty derives from a proper relationship between earth and sky. Accordingly, the Navajo mandala must be read not only laterally, the center to the four directions, but also vertically, for its unity of earth and sky. In fact, the principles of the two-in-one are essential for understanding the code of all Navajo and Tibetan mandalas. In this sacred circle, the center, earth, our mother, is the lower life. It is synonymous by the beauty, Bike Hozho, that manifests here. Centered upon the earth is the outline of North America, and centered in it are the four holy mountains. They define and protect the Navajo's sacred world that is, in turn, signified by a conical male hogan with a fire burning in its center. This central fire is the center of life. Surrounding the lower life, appearing like a donut, is the upper life. It is the sky, our father. He, in turn, signifies how the quest for beauty yields the everlasting spiritual life of a holy being, Sa'anagai. The two lives are linked by wind and rain. The rain originates as evaporated earth water that is materialized as clouds and permeated by the energy of lightning. It then falls to earth and is used before uh, re-evaporating. This is a material description of what is, for the Navajo, a sacred event dynamically linking the upper and lower lives. Surrounding both realms is a four-colored rainbow. The outside ring is red, the color of blood and of vitality. Red is also the color of danger and protection. Blue, its cooler and calmer counterpart, is the color of the next ring inward. Red and blue are sufficient to signify to the Navajo mind the protective character of the rainbow. The two inner rings are yellow and white. 
They are corn colors and signify the union of female yellow and male white life force principles. The red and blue rainbow protects them. Taken as a whole, they also signify the four world realities existing before the current multicolored fifth world. Finally, <clears throat> as if riding the rainbow, are the sun and moon. Standing within them, mounted on their turquoise and white shell horses, are the indwelling divinities, sun bearer and moon bearer. Together they comprise a primal pair in Navajo thought. Each upper life quadrant is illuminated by a different colored cardinal light mist, as are the four sacred mountains below them on the earth. In the colors ESWN, white, blue, yellow, and dark black, each is imbued with a cardinal light being. Navajos say that these mists allow the earth to think and breathe. Indeed, colored winds are said to control the vital force and mind of every being. Each quadrant is synonymous with the portions of the day, the seasons of the year, and the phases of one's life. Each quadrant contains a thundercloud array, cloud, rain, and lightning. These arrays share the color of the skylight in the south and west, but instead of the black and white thunderclouds appearing in their respectively colored quadrants, they are reversed. There are three possible reasons for this. First, a black cloud signifies a cloud full of rain that is likely to fertilize the earth. It most properly belongs at the beginning of the natural cycle of things. Likewise, the white barren clouds of the winter are most appropriate for the northern quarter of the mandala. Second, the color reversal may be related to the Navajo's strong sense of spiritual protection. As East signifies the beginning of the cycle of life, it is there that protective energy, signified by the black color of the thundercloud, is needed. Certain nightway prayers invoke the protection of the leader, Thunderer of the East, who is of dark cloud. The third explanation is more metaphysical and relates to a sense of closure. Every circle must be closed, the loose ends tied up. The beginning and end must be unified. These ideas will be covered in greater detail later on. See Closing the Circle on Chapter 10, Mandala Universals. In Navajo symbolism, clouds signify the domain of the four thunder beings, while the background colors of the four quadrants relate to the wind chiefs and colored wind souls in the cardinal light mists. Wind is a primary symbol in fourfold mandala schemes of Navajo philosophy. Several respected chanters told the Navajo scholar Herbert Benali how four words, expressions of wind energy, spoken by Mother Earth, caused the placement of the primary colored winds within each person. This circle of sacred winds can be envisioned as, in the center, glittering big wind, multicolored holy wind. To the north, yellow wind, which is our thinking. To the south, white wind, which directs our life east to the west blue wind which gives power of movement and to the east dark wind when we carry out our plans the white wind of the east is the active leader wind it is the source of the white wind soul that is dispatched by dawn woman into a waiting form it is the coordinating mind power of the consciousness informing life the blue wind of midday gives movement and enables directed actions to take place for generating and maintaining life. The yellow wind of twilight powers the process of holistic thinking and reflection on the previous events of the day, year, or lifetime. And the dark wind of the north is the mind breath of the dangerous night, but also the strong energy that allows one to disperse obstacles to the successful implementation of one's plans. All four are aspects of the all-pervasive, multicolored, glittering big wind, or holy wind. Another traditional mandala paradigm has become the focus of the Diné educational philosophy project of Navajo Community College. It ascribes life processes to the four directions. In the center, life and knowledge. To the north, living. To the south, thought itself. East, uh, or, or to the south, thought itself. To the, to the west planning, to the east security. East is the place in which thought or awareness arises. 
uh, things dawn on the mind and it awakens to lead the organism through a day or a lifetime. South is where the mind plans out one's life and begins to act upon those plans with the full energy of the sun in its zenith. The west, sunset, is a time for harvesting the fruits of one's earlier thoughts, plans, and actions, as it is for gathering the family in the warmth of the hogan. It is the summation of living in the world, and once this groundwork has been laid, one encounters sleep's repose with a sense of security, having lived according to beauty during the daylight hours, tempered by a healthy respect for the potentially dangerous powers of the long dark night. Although they use slightly different metaphors, these two Navajo circles of the spirit contain the same essential message, that life is a cyclic, holistic experience based upon the natural movement of the cosmos. Synthesizing the two approaches in the East, the consciousness awakens so as to initiate life on the daily spiritual path. In the South, planning and action merge to provide a means of subs uh, subsistence. The West is a place of reflection and pulling together of the results of one's thoughts and actions. And the North, where dissipation and danger abound, is also a place of security, since it draws on the energy of darkness for protection and accomplishment. The most immediate expression of these four aspects of the totality is found in the Navajo understanding of the cycle of the day. The Navajo's every waking moment is, ideally, suffused with beauty, making each day a holy day, a holiday. The eminent Blessing Way chanter Frank Mitchell described the Navajo Holy Day as a cycle from dawn to darkness. His words are rendered here, beginning with the dawn statement, in a concrete, mandalic manner. Navajo Holy Day in the center to the east dawn will be the first cause for people to move. To the west evening twilight is the guide for people in coming together again. To the south sky blue is the guide for people going abroad and working. And to the north darkness will direct them to sleep in partnership with the stars and the constellations. For the Navajo, mind and matter are generally envisioned in mandalic form. From the cycle of the day, to the season of one's life, to the energies and elements of the earth and sky, to the qualities of one's body-mind, all move in a fourfold circle based upon the, mul the, multi uh, the multiplication of follower pairs. At this point, the great benediction that is part of most Chantway songs and every Navajo's daily prayers comes again to mind. It is a verbally generated mandala that beautifully sums up the Navajo's view of the relationship between self and cosmos. In beauty now before me I walk, before equals east. In beauty now behind me I walk, behind equals west. In beauty now below me I walk, below equals earth. In beauty now above me I walk, above equals sky. In beauty all around me I walk, all around equals macrocosm. In beauty now within me I walk. Within equals microcosm. It is finished in beauty. All is according to beauty. Tibetan Mandala The universal model of the circle of the spirit is central to all Tibetan mandalas. Consider the following generalized mandala image, figure 96, depicting our present world reality as it floats below the sun and moon. Surrounding the most tantric mandalas, inner precincts are up to four rings of protection. The outermost is a form of rainbow containing sections of the four directional colors, ESWN, blue, yellow, orange, red, and dark green, each topped by a bit of white. This ring is called the Mountain of Fire and is likened to the fires that burn at the end of every world eon. Its flames are the five wisdom energies that immolate the mental delusions composing primordial ignorance. The next ring inward toward the center of the mandala's ideal reality is a fence of Dorje, thunderbolt scepters. Their diamond-hard nature and lightning energy are symbolic of the indestructible tantric method for attaining the awakened mind. Thunderbolt scepters are also used in rites of exorcism and purification to control the powers of evil and deluded mind. This is their function in the mandala as well. 
The third concentric ring is optional in that it is only used in mandalas representing the reality of deities of fierce power. It represents the, char the carnal grounds wherein bodies are cut up and offered to birds of prey as a sky burial. This ring signifies the cutting away of the bones and flesh of illusion on the way to the primordial ground at the mandala's center. In some mandalas, it is positioned outside of the mountain of fire ring. The fourth ring consists of a large. Uh, it consists of a hedge of lotus petals. It is the subtle boundary uh, marking the threshold of the inner grounds of the deity's palace, that faces out to the cardinal directions. This is the enlightened reality composed of the mind's clear light, and the goal of the tantric practitioner's heroic quest toward the center. The inner precincts of the tantric mandala are supported by giant crossed thunderbolt scepters which are often envisioned as floating in space somewhere above the summit of the central mountain of the cosmos. The sacred world Axis Mountain rises at the center of seven concentric rings of Golden Mountain and seven seas. Above its summit, floating on lotus-shaped clouds, is the palace of a tantric tutelary deity. Our present world reality is found on the southern, bottom continents as they float in a primordial ocean. The world system has one major and two lesser-sized continents, positioned to each cardinal direction. They are shaped according to humanity's most ancient geometric symbols, east, south, west, and north, semicircle, triangle, circle, and square. In ritual mandalas, the world mountain system is rarely shown. Rather, at the focus of the mandala are the tutelary deity's palace, shown atop the mountain in, uh, in this figure, and his or her emanations within, often in union with their consorts. They are positioned at the center of the palace and to the cardinal directions, their quadrants lining up with the stylized entranceways to the building. In tantric mandalas depicting the unity of the five transcendent or conqueror Buddha families, their wisdom energies are signified by uh, by their forms and by symbolic emblems. At the mandala center may be an eight-spoked wheel of the spiritual teachings, or it will show a white-bodied deity, the one who makes things visible, Nampanangzi Vairokana, who is bathed in the clear white light of unstained awareness. The Eastern Buddha family is symbolized by a thunderbolt scepter and is bathed in blue light. It is the realm of the unshakable one, Mikyopa Akshobhya, but also can contain the diamond being. The southern quarter is bathed in the golden yellow light of the noonday sun and is symbolized by a group of flaming jewels. This is the realm of the jewel-born one, Rinchen Chundren Ratnasambhava, the western quarter, symbolized by a lotus flower in full bloom, is the orange-red color of the setting sun and the realm of boundless light, Opame Amitabha. The north is the dark green, midnight sky-colored realm of the all-encompassing one, Donyo Drupa Amogasiddhi, whose symbol is a flaming sword. It is sometimes replaced by a cross double dorje signifying the stability of completion and of the motion of the cosmos. These conqueror of samsaric suffering Buddhas, along with their consort ether goers, embody the five transcendent wisdoms and vital energies. They are the same stuff as the five aggregates making up one's total being, one's form, body, feelings, emotions, discriminations, thoughts and perceptions, volitions, concepts and actions, and the consciousness, awareness that coordinates them all. The human psychological totality, enlightened wisdoms, and associated Buddha families are condensed in the following uh, mandala schematic. In the center, Buddha family, absolute wisdom, purified awareness. To the east, thunderbolt family, mirror-like wisdom, purified form body. To the west, lotus family, discriminating wisdom, purified thoughts and perceptions. To the south, jewel family, equalizing wisdom, purified feelings. To the north, karma family, all accomplishing wisdom, purified concept, acts. <clears throat> the east mirror-like wisdom is the ability to see one's place in phenomenal reality as it really is, like a reflection in a mirror. 
This means that in the ordinary world it appears as if one exists solely of and by oneself as total self-existence, but in the absolute nature of things one's body-mind is ever-changing and actually is empty of definable form and self-existence, since the mirror's clear reflected light is that of lightning, thunderbolt, and the white light of dawn, the thunderbolt scepter is the appropriate emblem of the wisdom energy of the East. The South equalizing wisdom is knowing that one is utterly interconnected with all other beings, sharing the spark of awareness and wind of vitality. The Lama signify this by the statement, we all have been each other's mothers over countless previous lifetimes. Just as one must respect one's own mother, a person must become wise to every being's inherent uh, equality and so equalize one's feelings through altruism toward others. Extending one's heartfelt feelings and psychophysical wisdom in this way is like spreading out the warm rays of the noonday sun over fields of flowers. The increasing or giving powers of equalizing wisdom are vividly symbolized by six flaming, wish-fulfilling jewels growing out of a lotus flower. Thus the jewel is the emblem for the wisdom energy of the southern quarter of the five Buddhas. The West's discriminating wisdom refers to the enlightened knowledge attained by applying one's mental energy to meditation on the true nature of reality. One harnesses one's thoughts and perceptions to establish the mind in a state of equipoise, of peace like the quiet of sunset. Here the wind energies of the mind are flowing properly so that the awareness is fully receptive to contemplations relating to one's form and feelings. Since the pure, clearly lit mind's light arises out of the dark swamp of impure thoughts, feelings, and actions, this Buddha family's wisdom energy is symbolized by a lotus. The beautiful lotus flower grows out of the mud at the bottom of a murky pond, just as the mind of enlightenment arises from the depths of ordinary mind. The North's all-encompassing wisdom is acquired by harnessing the wild horse of body-mind to manifest concepts and actions that are powerful yet free of any negative results. The universal law of cause and effect, lay in Tibetan, karma in Sanskrit, teaches that given our existence in a state of suffering, it is imperative that we actively purify our body-minds of negative ideas and actions, but without ceasing to live in the world. By attaining this wisdom, we can cut through all obstacles to accomplishing our tasks, while leaving no negative effects. As the North is a place of awesome power, danger, and protection for Tibetans, as it is for the Navajo, its darkness is the appropriate environment for generating this enlightened wisdom of all accomplishment. The sword is the emblem of such vanquishing wisdom energy. In the center is the sum total of these wisdoms, absolute wisdom. It is associated with the coordinating consciousness, with its unstained clear light awareness, to purify the energy of awareness and instruct the consciousness in the ultimate nature of reality, the emptiness of the void requires the collaboration of other wisdoms and their associated energies. Absolute wisdom is at the hub of the mandala's wheel, the still point at which one is in total balance, not a rigid kind of balance, but the dynamic equilibrium such as one sees in a spinning gyroscope. Its symbol is the eight-spoked wheel of the Buddhist teachings. The Buddha Shakyamuni had turned the wheel of Buddhism when he first taught the Dharma at Sarnath's Deer Park. Accordingly, the wheel is appropriate emblem of the most central and encompassing of enlightened wisdom energies, that of the Mandala uh, Central or Buddha family. So the Tibetan Mandala is both a spiritual draftsman schematic of the abode of tantric deities and a model for the integra integrated enlightened personality body-mind. It shows that all aspects of mind and form are connected with the movement of one's outer and inner reality in a systematic fashion. As such, meditation, using a tantric mandala, becomes a potent means for connecting the individual with the abiding nature of things. It is no wonder, therefore, that Tibetan and Navajo mandalas appear uncannily similar. Mandala Universals 
Tibetans and Navajos see themselves as existing in the center of a moving, changing, fourfold pattern of energies, qualities, and ideas that compose their phenomenal world. Their spiritual teachings provide model patterns in the form of mandalas through which they can access the ideal qualities of their deities and of themselves. Navajo and Tibetan tutelaries, the Yeis and Yidams, are commonly shown within their own mandala universes. As the divinities are convenient embodiments of the natural powers and operating outside and within our body minds, they and their mandalas express the ultimate pattern of things, beauty and the void. Both traditions have vast numbers of such mandalas, and they are encoded using deities, colors, and objects signifying specific characteristics of body-mind and cosmos that are appropriate at various times and to various individuals. Let's consider important examples from both traditions. Variations of the Mandala Code, Navajo Examples our first example is how Navajo masters encoded their ritual sand mandalas uh, comes from the Shooting Way rite. The legendary spiritual journey informing the Shooting Way revolves around episodes in the lives of the warrior twins, their mother Changing Woman, and their father the Sun Bearer. The warrior twins had, their, uh, had been empowered as full-fledged warriors by the Thunderers, energy chiefs of the Cardinal Directions, during their quest for their father, the Sunbearer. The twins later underwent a special metamorphosis. Monster Slayer and Child Born for Water emanated into four warriors. The new member of each pair became a milder version of the original. The chanters explain the second pair is originating in the placental afterbirth of the first twins, but they are, first and foremost, spiritual clones. They are very real figments of the powerful group imagination of the Navajo, who know that in the end all reality emanates from the mind. Commenting on this four-in-one identity of the warrior twins, the eminent student of Navajo religion, Gladys Reichardt, observed, If the Navajo conception that nothing exists in and for itself, or absolutely at a particular time, or at a given point is understood, the legends upon which the ceremonial procedure is based are quite intelligible. With these words, she inadvertently expressed the Tibetan view of the void nature of reality and the process of emanating out of such emptiness various ideal beings with ideal qualities and powers of body-mind. The fourfold warrior twins make an important appearance during the annals of the male branch version of the Shooting Way legend. They return to the home of their mother, Changing Woman, located at the center of the world. Here, at Encircled Mountain, place of the twins' birth, they try, each in his own way, to convince Changing Woman to leave the ancestral home and join Sunbearer at their new island home in the west. In attempting to change her mind, they bring to bear their prodigious powers, since she is understandably attached to the center of the Navajo sacred world. The Shooting Way sand painting, called The House of Many Points, <coughs> shows the proceedings the senior twins monster slayer and child born for water wield potent zigzag lightning while their milder complements are equipped with straight lightning uh, growing out of changing woman's hogan are the four domesticated plants corn beans squash and tobacco and the entire array is protected by a rainbow goddess and the sun and moon more than deities of legend, the four twins represent four different kinds of conquering energy in action. Monster Slayer is the often fierce, jump-to-it protective and warrior energy of the four. He is the impulsive, unstoppable energy that is motivated by concern for his mother's well-being. As leader and emblem of all their combined powers, Monster Slayer stands at the eastern quarter of the mandala. In the west stands his milder, placental emanation, reared within the mountain. He too is a fiery and protective being, but he uses words instead of actions, some being quite aggressive and even disrespectful. Together they form the active east-west axis of the sand mandala's reality. Child born for water embodies Monster Slayer's main uh, complementary energy. When his more active brother is off battling obstacles, Child born for water psychically monitors his well-being, using his talking prayer sticks as divination tools. He is the essence of the warrior's caution, conservation of energy, and thoughtful preparation for battle. 
child born for water's emanation is changing grandchild. He is known for being able to soothe angry gods. He even uses his quality to pacify monster slayers' formidable wrath. In general, he represents the peaceful, centered quality necessary for the warrior to accomplish his goals and return with a balanced mind. These two nurturing aspects of warriorship comprise the South-North Axis. As members of a four-in-one unit, they are each aspects of the total spiritual warrior who must internalize their four qualities in order to vanquish enemies threatening from without and within. These qualities are East, South, West, and North, one, fierce dispelling or destroying of obstacles, two, protective nurturing, three, intensely convincing powers of speech, and four, the ability to make peace. 